Hi, welcome back to my channel. I'm Marsha, and in today's video I'm going to show you, Transcribe Me, Grammar, Guidelines, and the 3 Audio Test Answers. Without further ado let's begin.
So we're kind of making a distinction between demand in terms of the being somebody actually deciding to uh, hire a credit repair organization. You're saying use has increased. So we're kind of making a distinction between demand in terms of people who are interested in the services, use being somebody actually deciding to uh, hire a credit repair. So we're kind of making a distinction between demand in terms of people who are interested in the services, use being somebody actually services, use being somebody actually deciding to uh, hire a credit repair organization. Would you say use has increased, decreased, or stayed the same? Would you say use has increased, decreased, or stayed the same? Would you say use has increased, decreased, or stayed the same over the past three years? Has increased, decreased, or stayed the same over the past three years? Probably. Has increased, decreased, or stayed the same over the past three years? Probably increased. Past three years. Past three years. Probably increased. Probably increased. When you think about the the overall landscape of companies, uh, when you think about the, the overall landscape would you of say that the number of credit repair organizations has increased, decreased, or stayed the same? The, the overall landscape of companies uh, from your Chris? Now, we're talking about number of companies, but then market share in terms of, like, who's actually getting the business. Has market share among credit repair organizations uh, become more consolidated, more distributed, or stayed the same? More distributed. Uh, what would you say? The more distributed. Uh, what would you say are the primary factors that that contribute to those observations? Um, Let's start with the consumer piece. Factors that that contribute to those. That contribute to those observations. 
Um, Let's start with the consumer piece first. Like you thought that you know that credit repair is is a service that's out there. Observations. Um, Let's start with the consumer piece first. Like you thought that you know that credit repair is is a service that's out there. Observations. Um, Let's start with the consumer piece first. Like you thought that you know that credit repair is. Um, Let's start with the consumer piece first. Like um, Let's start with the consumer piece first. Like um, Let's start with the consumer piece first. Like you thought that you know that credit repair is is a service. Like you thought that you know that credit repair is that credit repair is is a service credit repair is is a service that's out there stayed about the same but Demand and use is that credit repair is, is a service that's out there stayed about the same, but demand and use is increased. To what would you attribute that? Use is increased. To what use is increased? To what would you demand and use is increased? To what would you attribute that? Use is increased. To what would you demand and use is increased? To what would you attribute that? Most likely um, Google Trend data on a keyword level. Most likely um, Google trend data on a keyword level and um, judging the overall landscape based on A, the number of competitors and B, the competitors and B, the, the digital presence those competitors have, especially post COVID. I think there's generally been, especially post COVID, I think there's generally been a rise across the board. What do you think is causing consumers to rise across the board? What do you think is causing consumers to what do you think? is causing what do you think is causing consumers to have more demand and use of credit repair so i think there's the actual macro landscape which is simply a function of consumer so i think there's the actual macro landscape which is simply a function of consumers um you know having more collections, having more potentially inaccurate negative items on their credit report. Um, but then simultaneously, their credit use is going up, their delinquency rates are going up, and overall debt um, is probably close to 2008 levels, if not higher. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that it, it's close to peak. Um, you know, I I, I think that's kind of the indirect, or at least the the circumstances that allow for an increase of in indirect, or at least the the circumstances that allow for an the circumstances that allow for an increase of in demand. And I think once consumers actually attempt to identify how to uh, fix their credit because they have debt, they have delinquencies, etc., um, they'll go online. And I think the sophistication of some of these companies is relatively low in terms of capturing capturing um, capturing um, those acquisition potentials. But I think the companies that do it pretty well, um, there is a general increase in awareness.
there is a general increase in awareness just by proxy of having more um, efficient digital campaigns across. Board. So, for example, with our campaigns across the board, so for example, there is a general increase in awareness just by there is a general increase in awareness just by proxy of having more um, efficient digital campaigns across the board. So, for example, with our company, SEO is a big piece we do right now. Company SEO is a big piece we do right now, and one of the ways that we've been able to capture some of that indirect demand is by creating over three thousand landing pages or SEO landing. creating over 3,000 landing pages or SEO landing pages around every major collection company keyword in the U.S. And so we've been able to, um, in some ways, inc artificially increase that demand by funneling users that we're able to, um, in some ways, inc artificially increase that demand by funneling users that would otherwise type able to um, in some ways, inc artificially increase that demand by funneling users to, um, in some ways, inc artificially increase that demand by funneling users that would otherwise type, you know, XYZ collections. Otherwise type, you know, XYZ collections that would otherwise type, you know, XYZ collection users that would otherwise type, you know, XYZ collections. Type, you know, XYZ collections into Google. Um, they would have a list of very convoluted search results. They would have. They would have a list of very convoluted search results that didn't necessarily help them at all. There might be some FAQ articles, maybe, um, you know, some ads at the top, obviously, from paid. But there is no cohesive, hey, you know, we're a credit repair company. Hey, you know, we're a credit repair company. We've scaled out these SEO pages and we could legitimately help you um, by giving you a free consultation and then funnel you into our services. So, gotcha. And I noticed. Services. So. Gotcha. And I noticed. On your website. Gotcha. And I noticed on your website, you have uh, a page that then links to a series of pages comparing to uh, various competitors. Right. And I would imagine that that is at least in part SEO driven. So that totally makes sense. Before I be imagine that that is that is at least in part SEO driven. So that totally makes sense. Before I became a, a, an analyst and consultant, it was a journalist and uh, I, I was the editor in chief of a, of a trade publication for the mortgage industry. And uh, SEO strategy was a big part of our mission and challenge. And certainly my job as, as the editor in chief to kind of make sure, you know, not just that we were producing.
you know, not just that we were producing great content, but that people were finding it, right? So um, I, I, uh, I respect a strong SEO game, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, how do you view market position relative to competitors? What would you say are your strengths and we- or, or weaknesses? Your strengths and we- or, or weaknesses? Um, I think compared to... I think compared to competitors, um, every major value proper feature that we've identified, we're stronger than our competitors, or at least on par. And all the areas that we're on par with, we're very aggressively working toward at least on par. And all the areas that we're on par with, we're very aggressively working toward being significantly better. have uh, a page that then links to a series of pages comparing to uh, various competitors, right? And I would imagine that that is You know, as well. Ian Oswald in Great Britain and Anthony Kales at UCLA were the first to study hypnotics in terms of all-night sleep laboratory testing. That began when barbiturates were really the only thing available. It was clear that barbiturates were addicting and that they were dangerous. This was about the time when the very first benzodiazepine hypnotic was marketed by Hoffman LaRoche Company, and it was called Florazepam. Dalmain was more effective than, say, Nembutal. It was certainly much, much safer and tended not to lose its efficacy over a relatively short period of time. Now, nobody was studying sleep every night for months. Testing that was done, Dalmain, first of all, did not suppress REM sleep. So one of the things was it didn't suppress REM sleep. Well, it does suppress somewhat at a higher doses, but at any rate, it induced sleep, it was safe, it didn't suppress REM sleep. And what they missed entirely in those early days was that Dalmain had a long-acting active metabolite. Sedation continued in the daytime. 
The second generation of benzodiazepine hypnotics was marketed by the Upjohn Company, and it was triazolam. Uh, the first big breakthrough in uh, hypnotic efficacy uh, research was the use of the sleep laboratory. The second big breakthrough, frankly, was the principle that you have 24-hour day, and if sleep is improved at night, then alertness must be improved during the day. Comparing Dalmain to Halcyon, it was like day and night. Uh, Halcyon improved sleep and improved daytime alertness using mobile sleep latency tests. Dalmain improved sleep, but it, it impaired daytime alertness. Meanwhile, a new compound was being developed again in France, uh, which has the trade name Ambien, and it was an imidazopyridine non-benzodiazepine, although it, it apparently was a uh, benzodiazepine agonist. It was, to some extent, an improvement. It did not produce any withdrawal effects. With Halcyon, when it was first marketed, the FDA did get reports of side effects, but certainly there was less when Ambien was introduced. I think it has passed the test of time in that regard. There just hasn't been any notoriety at all. My position is that a bottle of sleeping pills in the medicine cabinet is like a fire extinguisher in the basement. There are times when you need to get sleep and you can't. Lots of stories around the country, some very tragic, where they had terrible insomnia and then some tragic consequence due to the excessive daytime sleepiness. Meanwhile, physician refusing to prescribe. It is now known, of course, that, that there is a circadian rhythm of melatonin secretion. In constant dim light, there's a specific period of onset of melatonin secretion under the control of the biological clock, and then it is in the, uh, the system all night long. It's suppressed by light. It is, there's a level of melatonin through the night, and then it, it decreases in the daytime. Now, one thing that is known, there are melatonin receptors in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The biological clock can be, its time can be shifted by the administration of melatonin, for, for individuals who have insomnia due to uh, the failure of synchrony between the daytime schedule and the circadian rhythm, you can shift the clock by giving melatonin at times when it ordinarily isn't present. Many people feel that melatonin is also sedating and that in some way it sort of initiates the whole sleep process. I think that studies in which it has been used purely as a hypnotic have been, in my opinion, somewhat inconclusive. It is certainly not a potent sedative. The, the main reason for the widespread use of melatonin is, number one, you don't need a prescription. It's sold in, in health food stores. It's a normal hormone, so it ought to be very safe. Apparently, it is not totally dose dependent. So, in health food stores, it's a normal hormone, so it ought to be. sold in, in health food stores. It's a normal hormone, so it ought to be very safe. Apparently, it is not totally dose-dependent, so a very small dose produces for some people at least the desired effect. But I think we have more to learn about melatonin. Ian Oswald in Great Britain and
one of the most important comments on deceit for the modern period, I think, was made by Adam Smith, uh, who is greatly revered but very little read. He uh, pointed out that a major goal of business is. comments on deceit for the modern period, I think, was made by Adam Smith, uh, who is greatly revered but very little read. He uh, pointed out that a major goal of business is to deceive and oppress the public uh, for good reasons. One of the striking features of the modern period is the uh, institutionalization of that process so that we now have huge industries uh, devoted to deceiving the public. And they're very conscious about the public relations industry, which strikingly developed in the freest countries for good reason. <laughs> You've reached the end of this video. Did you find those answers helpful? If so say thank you to me by pressing the like button, leave a comment in the comment section below, and hit that subscribe button. Thank you for watching.